سبحان الله يعني I came from Harsden <laughs> for those that know Harsden I'm a London boy come and I'm now helping the Sheikh that I've heard so much about يعني where is this going to go kind of thing and subhanAllah the Sheikh was nothing but gentle kind he thanked me as if I'm taking my grandfather to the masjid to pray salah literally that's, that's those were the emotions حركاتهم وهمومهم وعزومهم لله لا للخلق والشيطان نعم الرفيق لطالب السبل التي تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان تفضي إلى الخيرات والإحسان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين I hope إن شاء الله you're all well and in good health brothers and sisters now as promised um, part two of reminiscing the scholars so alhamdulillah Allah enabled us to talk about our noble Sheikh Sheikh Rabi' in the first part when I first ever encountered the Sheikh and met him in Mecca many many years ago and then due to the death of our beloved Sheikh Sheikh Abdurrahman Muhyiddin rahimahullah I saw it as only befitting to touch about the moments that Allah enabled us to be able to have shared with the noble Sheikh May Allah have mercy on him, elevate his ranks, and make him from Jannah to Firdaus Ta'ala and all the Muslims. May Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us all for our shortcomings, elevate us in ranks, and enable us to be from those that naqtadi. We follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam upon the Quran and Sunnah, and we use that as a means of our guidance, meaning we use the Quran and the Sunnah, we follow that which is in the Quran and the Sunnah, and we try our utmost best to be the best ambassadors as we can. So subhanAllah brothers and sisters, this life is short. This life is very, very short. And me sharing these moments is not in any sort of way or form to have any sort of anything, if that makes sense. Except for just the fact that Hopefully it will be, I hope, it will be of a benefit to one that listens and then wants to, you know, I hope I encourage the youth or those that have the capability to go out and study under the feet of the ulama because there is no better way or method to learn the deen of Allah except by studying under those that have the chains you know the strong chain that they their teachers were scholars and their teachers were scholars and it goes down as a chain meaning they studied under the ulama themselves and then Allah facilitated for them and gave them the basira that insight and that knowledge and subhanallah in order for you to be able to have any sort of change, especially being from someone from the West specifically, unfortunately, as us living in the West as Shabab, we, we tend to have this uh, uh, culture where our mannerisms is far from Islam, despite the fact that maybe our household, our parents may teach us, you know, good mannerisms and what have you, but when we go out eight hours to nine to 10 hours a day, you're in school, primary, secondary, and what have you, and you're learning, and you're being cultivated, you're being, you know, it's, it's been instilled in you, the characteristics of non-Muslims, characteristics of non-Muslims, non you're, you're picking up from other children as well, you're learning, so it becomes a thing where it's a habit now, every single day, you have to live up to the standards as well, it becomes peer pressure then, peer pressure comes in, what becomes in, and it's like all that which you've been taught, it's like you have to try and cover it, wear like a barrier, wear like a, you know, a, a coat, when you're in school, as if you don't know that what you're about to do is wrong or, you know, it's completely against the morals of Islam and the teachings of your parents, which may be, may be in line with the teachings of Islam. But because you're in this society, in this environment where you have to kind of try to fit in, otherwise you'll be laughed at, you'll be mocked, you'll be, you know, talked about, then you tend to just completely close or, you know, cover that whole essence of you having shyness the sisters having shyness and what have you or from, from the brothers as well having good mannerisms and shyness as well and then it becomes a thing where after several years it becomes something that you almost 
kind of it becomes second nature it becomes normal and you start to have a liking towards these characteristics but picked up from the streets from school from society and then unfortunately even when you and you see this many times even when you now when Allah guides you you have these bad traits and it's difficult to take away from because you haven't seen anything else hence why I always say to the parents and to those that have the capability from the Shabab try to go out when it comes to learning the deen you can't learn the deen I'm not saying you can't but you can't properly learn the deen by yourself you can learn the deen in this wherever you are in the world online and what have you but learning it properly you can't self-teach yourself so when you go out and you learn from that which the Prophet ﷺ says you know the scholars are the what are the inheritors of the prophets okay and those that take from that has take have been worth it you've, you've basically benefited a great tremendous benefit why because you've learned from those that also they were talking scholars and scholars and scholars and it's a chain of narration you know and that is the way where you see the way they deal why because they've been affected by the ayat of allah by the ahadith of the prophet sallallahu okay the ayat of allah Azza wa has affected them they have learned properly because they have sat down and learned properly the quran the sunnah so point being is that when you learn from the scholars and you see the way they are then you won't be fooled with any other person any other muhammad is haq and abdullah and anyone else that comes about and tries to tell you the deen is this way and also you won't be being, you also you also will be saved from being brainwashed so now delving straight into it and this is the way it should be and from the salaf subhanallah we know that how many of them used to what travel miles thousands kilometers traveling that which will probably take us i don't know how long now but back then they used to do on foot camel horse whatever means of transportation they had there was no planes there was no cars and they would travel some of them would travel hungry from abu huraira radiallahu anhu who would take us a lesson he used to travel and leave off all that which he needs in terms of what food why because he wanted to learn and benefit from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he would travel miles and stay with him and be with him sacrifice why because he knows in the long run he's going to be the one to benefit it's going to change him he's going to learn the hadith the way the prophet sallam was and look at how we're benefiting up until today from abu huraira radiyallahu anhu may allah be pleased with him abdur rahman ibn sakhr al-dawsi radiyallahu anhu so from that the tabi'een came and they learned from their companions and they would travel to them when some of the companions were in Kufa, in, in Basra and other places and they left Medina and what have you, they would travel. And then also, Atba'a tabi'een that came after the tabi'een, they would also travel. There's narration, subhanAllah, that comes in when you read the kutub of the, and the biographies of the salaf, some of them mentions that they would what? Some of them would even drink their own urine and that's what they would have when the water would run out. Now look at the, how much how much zeal they had, how much love they want, they really wanted to learn. Where it's even mentioned in Imam Bukhari, he would travel miles and miles and miles just for one hadith. If he knows that this person is the only one that has the hadith, he would travel all that far. All of those miles he would travel, subhanAllah. And when he's traveling, he's traveling to get this hadith because he knows that this is the person that carries and has memorized this hadith from the companions or the Prophet and what have you. And then of course he would look at to see how his characteristics are how his how he carries himself is it something that he goes against the culture and the ad that which is common and known to the people or is he someone that has uprightness morals and then he will take from him so there was even conditions so they will travel so far and so many of them it's mentioned that they had parts some of the salaf they had parts where some of them it was known that they would leave, let's say they were born and raised in Mecca, they'll stay in Mecca and travel and benefit, and benefit from all the ulama. When they would finish, they'll go to Medina, Hijaz. And then from there, they'll go to Najd, which is now known as the sides of Riyadh and Qasim and what have you. And then from there, they'll leave and go to Basra. And then from there, they'll go to Kufa. And then from there, so it was all just for the sake of learning the deen and benefiting from the other ulama and memorizing and taking from them the deen so to preserve it so brothers and sisters don't let this society today which has made it so easy for us to learn by just listening make a means where your himma your high aspiration becomes completely low where you're just now saying what's the point i don't need to travel i can just get it online there's not it's not the same wallahi the sweetness and the beauty of sitting under a scholar in a majlis of ilm, in a gathering of knowledge, 
is not the same as you just listening online and hearing that which the scholar may have to say. There's a big difference. Min al mashriq al maghrib, literally from east to west, honestly. Why? Because when you sit under, and as it's known, as if you read the biography of Mat Ahmed, it's mentioned that his mother would what? Get him ready, you know, beautify him and get him ready, make him wear his, his amama and what have you, and make him go and benefit from the teacher that's going to teach him, to benefit mannerisms. And so many, and it's known, there's so many of them. So this is the point I was getting to as well. I just remembered that so many of the Salaf, it was mentioned that we studied uh, uh, adab and akhlaq, we studied what? Mannerism, 20 to 30 years. تعلمنا الأخلاق والأداب عشرين سنة ثم تعلمنا العلم and then أو حديث we literally 20 to 30 years they're learning what mannerisms of that teacher or of that person and then afterwards they learn what? they learn and then they delve into learning knowledge why? because when you have أخلاق and you have good mannerisms then it's going to impact and, 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 and affect you more when you start learning knowledge but when you start learning knowledge first and then you've got all these bad traits you got all these bad, you know, akhlaq and what have you. And you don't have mannerisms. You don't know how to speak to a teacher, how to respect them. You don't know the value or the, or the status of a scholar and what have you. Or the status of knowledge and the deen, how heavy it is. Then you start learning straight away knowledge. You're going to have all these bad traits that even people wouldn't even want to take from you. Or there won't even be any sort of effect that you would have on the people. Not that that's the, that should be your intention, but... Generally speaking, you yourself, you're not going to, the fruits are not going to be seen and apparent in terms of the way you carry yourselves. So that's why they would learn all of these things. They would learn characteristics, akhlaq. They used to even be al-mu'addib, someone that would come and teach. There used to be someone khas to teach the shabab akhlaq, how to sit, how to talk, how to be when you're around elders, how to drink and eat. Literally someone that would come and teach them. And it's like, for example, well, subhanAllah, look at how the non-Muslims learned that and took it from us. It was known in the Victorian times as well. You would find that many times, many of the uh, 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 young women, they would go and they will go to school in terms of how to be, how to conduct herself and what have you. So that if she will be from those that will be in line to be get put somewhere or before marriage, then she would, have taught, she would be taught how to be and how to conduct herself. And it's just something that Today, in terms of akhlaq and the importance of akhlaq, people forget about it. So, al-ulama, 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 upon you all is to go and try and benefit from the scholars. It's imperative, it's important. Learn directly from the scholars. Even your children as well, teach them who the ulama are. In terms of when to have respect for scholars, to know that this is a shaykh, have respect to you. It, it goes a long way for someone to go and sit underneath a scholar from them. You would learn akhlaq. And we'll mention it, inshallah, and touch on it. And I'm going kind of off topic, but it's la'allah, inshallah, it will be a benefit. You learn from the scholars mannerisms, how they conduct themselves, how they're samta, meaning many times you find that they will be quiet in many occasions. They won't be speaking. You would find that the way that they carry themselves is a certain way. The way they are when they hear the Quran, the way they are when they see new people coming towards them. All of this is because of the what? Because they themselves learn from scholars. You also learn from scholars, and like I said, it's a chain. So now, getting into the topic. Ala barakatillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So the Shaykh, Shaykh Rabi'i, Hafizahullah, may Allah Azza wa Jal give him strength and preserve him, and all the ulama. He came to Medina roughly around 2015, 2015. Now at this stage, I remember I was in Mustawa, I was leaving Fani, I was in Mustawa, Mustawa Thalith, Mustawa Thalith roughly in the Mahad, so I was still in the Arabic Institute. Now, I had moved, this was my second house now, because I moved from Hay Suhman, for those that know it, know it, for those that don't, don't, and then I moved to Hay Al Rabwa, Hay Al Rabwa, and um, this specific area, it wasn't something that was something that attracted me in the beginning when the brother showed it to me subhanallah but and then afterwards i thought to myself after i because at the time it was fairly new and in saudi arabia when places are new like an area is brand new it will have a couple of houses and a couple of off licenses or bakalas as it's known and it would just be mainly like desert so it'll be like a derelict area you know something derelict it's like it's not really there's not really much going on there 
So that's when I first was kind of introduced to the area. Hey, Rabbu, I thought, mm, yeah, it's not for me. You know, I'm from London. I like a bit of, you know, being able to hear people breathe, you know. But uh, that area was completely dead. So I thought to myself, it's not for me. And then I think a year and a half went by. Yeah, a year and a half roughly went by. And then I thought to myself, okay, let me go and move. So from 2012, 2013, I got shown the area roughly. And then 2014, and I thought to myself, okay, maybe this could work. And um, this by now, this time, there was a couple more shops. It was a bit, you know, looked livable for, for my likings and me and my wife's likings anyway. And um, so I moved to the area. And for those that know the area, so I lived on the side opposite to McDonald's. Literally, they call it Hay al Rabwa, some call it Hay al Arib. It's got different names, but it's famous for Hay al Rabwa. But the whole, like, borough is Hay al Arib. But the area that I lived in, Hay al Rabwa, within Hay al Arib, anyway. Like I said, it's got two names. So I lived there, so life was going on as normal, obviously going to my classes and what have you, da 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 da. And, um, then I hear rumours, so no, 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 before I hear rumours, I see, because obviously I used to drive around, whatever, and, you know, go into McDonald's, I have to go over, um, make a U-turn and go to the other side, and then I'll come back through different roads to get back to my side. So I saw this building being built, so I, I didn't take much of it, but I just thought, okay, maybe someone is building a new building, which is something literally right opposite my my building, something happened to the same, same thing, someone was building a new building. I thought that was going to be whole. I thought those were going to be uh, flats. So I thought maybe I could move there as well, because at the time, after the time went by and I had my first child, I remember my missus wanted to move. It was a fairly small apartment. It was just about enough for me and my wife and my little daughter. But we thought ahead, and my wife obviously thought ahead that if we were to, if she was to grow up, it would be a bit too small. So we needed to get somewhere bigger, somewhere, somewhere that's a bit more convenient. So anyway, we saw this building being built, and then I thought to myself, okay, mashallah, months went by, the building was become, was being built rather quickly compared to the building that had been in front of me, which looked like as if it was going to take 15 years to be built, the way they were going about it. So anyway, I saw this building being built, and then I remember time went by, and I just thought to myself, wow, this is really quick. So then I heard from other brothers, it just kind of like, you know, rumours, Medina is very small, by the way. So if something happens, you know, within the same day, a couple of hours later, someone's going to find, the whole of Medina will find out if it's something that is kind of gossip type or important, unfortunately. <laughs> so news went round. I took it as rumours because I didn't really know much. And, you know, no one really knew, no one confirmed that Sheikh Rabi is moving to Medina. He's coming back. Because bearing in mind, for those that don't know that, he lived in Medina in the beginning anyway. And then he went across to Mecca and he stayed there and then he moved back here. Um, I don't think I ever actually got to ask him as to why he did that. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I was told or someone did mention that he wanted to have, you know, both times, both parts of his life in the both most holiest places, cities in the world, Mecca and Medina. And he wanted to end his life in Medina. That's what I was told um, because of the virtues and what have you. So anyway, um, but he was really saddened when I obviously, because, okay, let me next jump. So he's now, um, I'm now hearing this, that he's moving to Medina. I'm hearing, okay, he's moving to Medina. Hmm. I didn't really take it, like I said, as anything because I thought it was just mere rumours. Now, after some time, the rumours started spreading even more, like we're hearing. I was, I'll be hearing with everyone talking about, did you know Sheikh Rabi come and come into Medina? And obviously, you know the Brits, Tabarak al-Rahman. <laughs> when it comes to rumours, they're the first ones on the whole story. They're, you know, tabloids and what have you. And we should, they should make a, we should have had in Medina, the, uh, what do you call it, newspaper articles, British uh, brothers studying in Medina, honestly. Anyway, so then I start, I, I, I thought to myself, okay, khair, yeah, alhamdulillah, khair. If we can benefit from the sheikh, that's khay. I'm the type of person where I don't really, okay, wow, yeah, the sheikh's moving, but it's just more about can I benefit from the sheikh or can I not? That's, that's me, the way I saw it anyway. That's how I am. So time went by, time went by, time went by. And then rumors now start to change. Sheikh Rabi is moving to Hayyar Rabwa. So I thought to myself, okay then, 
Yeah, I mean, this is getting interesting. Where is this going? Because it's like all of these things are building up and there is no concrete evidence. No one's telling me, yeah, for sure, whatever. But after some time went by, I started hearing it from brothers that I trust. And I said, Akhi, is it true? Khwani, is it true? And they were like, yeah, apparently. So for everyone, it was just rumours that they were hearing from other people. Okay, because in Medina at the time, the setup in Medina was... Um, the lessons that were going on at the time, Sheikh Ubaid, Allah, Sheikh Muhsin Abbad, obviously, Sheikh Saleh Hudayfi in the Haram, Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr, Sheikh Suleiman al Rahayli, Sheikh Nasr al Faqihi, Sheikh Ali Tawajiri, Sheikh Saleh Sindi, Sheikh Saleh Suhaimi, Sheikh Abdul Salam al Suhaimi. Uh, I don't want to miss out anyone. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi, that's not in the Haram. In his local, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many ulama teaching, and this is just the ones I remember on top of my head. I mean, bearing in mind, there's so many more. Okay, uh, who else? Yeah, subhanAllah, there were so many. Shahbala uh, Bukhari, you know, there's there were so many. There were, look, there were so many uh, lessons going on that it's like you have so much of a selection. And the good thing about Medina that's different to Riyadh, Riyadh, there's abundant of scholars. But it's very difficult to get to each one in terms of if you don't have a means of transportation. Not every single student that studies in the Jami'at in KSA has means of transportation. They don't all have cars. Now, if you don't have a car to get from A to B in Riyadh, wow, 40 minutes, hour, traffic, it's, it's hectic. It's havoc. Now, in Medina, whether you have a car or not, you just jump on that, even if by yourself. You know where the masjid is? Go into that taxi, tell him, listen. I'm going here, he'll take you there, you pay me money, raha. And then when you're coming back, you're definitely going to find the lift. It's that simple. So, at the time when I started hearing this, I must have now started driving past this house that no one obviously told me is here. I just, just seen it being built opposite where I live. So I started seeing Saudis gathering around every now and again. I thought to myself, okay, hold on. Hmm. And I thought, nah, nah, nah. You know when you just get, mm, it, nah, 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 nah. Don't get too excited, Abdullah. That's more or less impossible to happen. You know, because the thought that was going through my mind is, hey, maybe the sheikh is going to, I was like, nah, 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 okay, no, no, no. So then time went by, and then um, more time went by, the news kind of went silent. I remember this period of time where it just went quiet. No one was saying anything. Then afterwards, because bear in mind, I'm a, I'm a local now. I mean, that's my local area. I live in that area. So I can see what's going on and things are going to get to me in terms of, you know, me seeing them physically before anyone else that lives around the area. And also behind, yeah, well, not behind, but if you come out the chef's house on the right-hand side all the way there, it's the second of Bulag. So there's a second where the students live as well. They have their dormants there as well. Hey, Rabwa. So I live on the other side. And then afterwards, I started seeing... Uh, the a big one day I remember I saw this um, you know when people moving the the, the, the big vans or the trucks like, this wasn't a normal one that you see in the UK this the normal Amazon type kind of van this was a truck and I remember one time two of them came a big truck and it had like all sorts in it so now the house is getting complete when these two trucks left with, you know they had like final finishing touches um, the house was basically complete So then I started seeing more Saudis come They were like, they're checking it out Speaking, conversating between once amongst each other And then time went by I started seeing uh, One time I saw this um, this big kind of like furniture You know, uh, what do they call it? House removal Like, you know, when you're moving house And I sort of thought to myself Wow, it's like someone Someone obviously that has a lot of stuff is moving here But I've seen it before But not to this level so I thought to myself, wow, you know, and then it arrived and I saw the, obviously now I know it was the family of the sheikh, his sons, that were what? There and they were basically taking the stuff and, you know, the, the people that are working, the workers, they were basically putting the furniture and, all, and other things inside the house. So I thought to myself, okay, so someone, you know, that must... I thought to myself, someone that must be a bit important to some extent where, you know, or must, I, I thought to myself, okay, must be someone important or a big family that's moving, that's about to move in. 
Because I then I went past the house and I saw it's got a couple of floors. It's not just one floor. Okay, it's got like three floors. I thought to myself, okay. And the house was rather big. I was like, long verdict, mashallah. Time went by, time went by. Then I heard the sheikhs moving to Rabwa. Now, then the news started spreading back. It's official. He's moving to Rabwa. What happened was, I kid you not, I'm not telling, yeah, I'm, I kid you not, if I remember correctly, it was, it went on, so it went through the WhatsApp groups that Sheikh and Sheikh Rabia is moving back to Medina. And then I thought to myself, okay, so now it's not rumors. And then I double checked, obviously, with people that I trust, and they were like, yeah, apparently it's true, the Sheikh's moving pretty soon, you know, back to Medina. But everyone's not really 110% sure, but that's what it seems like it's, it's pretty soon. Time went by, um, so I don't want to tell you a lot of bits that are not important. <laughs> so time went by, subhanAllah, and then eventually the Sheikh, he actually, uh, it was, I was told that the Sheikh is going to move anytime soon. Anytime soon, the Sheikh's going to be with us in Medina. Now, just to kind of put a side note, this is not anything in terms of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen You know the ulama are you know those that we respect due to the knowledge they possess I want to make this very clear It's about the knowledge that they possess not about them as individuals Because we don't worship any individual We don't blind follow any individual like completely take what they say We don't defend any individual for the things that they have heard in or anything like that and why am I saying this? Kama qal Imam Malik rahimahullah when he went past the graveyard of the Prophet sallallahu in the Haram when he went past when he when he when he went past and he said kullun yu'khad wa yurad illa kullun yu'khad wa yurad qawluhu illa sahih hadha al-qabr he said each and every single individual you take from them and also you can reject from their speech and that which they say okay you can accept it and you can reject it accept and he pointed Then he pointed towards the, the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, Meaning the Prophet ﷺ was ma'asun He was infallible So therefore as Allah mentioned in the Quran He does not utter from mere desires Except the fact that it's a revelation being revealed unto him وسلم, So point being is that the Prophet ﷺ, We can take anything and we don't reject In terms of that which he has said It's all good for us That which he told us to stay safe from and stay away from it's bad for us. So just want to side note that, just so that everyone knows that we're not trying to manu uh, ahad. You know, we don't glorify and worship or you know put above their rank any individual, but rather, yeah, any every single person that loves the scholars, it should make them happy when they hear the news that a scholar is about to come to your city because of the knowledge that they possess and the fact that you'll be able to benefit. Now going back. When the Sheikh, when it was mentioned that he's, yeah, he's moving, it became official now. So then I heard from certain brothers, like, did you hear, Akhi, the Sheikh's moving to Rabwa? And someone else said, Akhi, did you hear the Sheikh's moving to your end? <laughs> this is the British law. Did you hear, Akhi, the Sheikh's moving to Rabwa? So then I was like, okay, okay, yeah, I mean, like, again, me, I don't, I don't just jump on information like that. I like to first find out if it's true, concrete, evidence, sound, you know, by someone that I trust. And then um, more things started being moved in, more things started being, being moved in. Let's get straight into it. I don't want to delay any longer and say I'll leave you lot there because that's going to be sad. The Sheikh eventually came to Medina. Now, I realized the house being circulated by certain individuals that were kind of known in Medina, um, some of them Saudis. Some of them non Saudis from the West that I used to see in other places and they were close to some of the ulama. Then I realized that's actually the Sheikh's house. Fi'lan, it's true, the Sheikh has moved to Medina. Now, my first, I should say, ever encounter, I think probably more or less was the same as all the other brothers that were there present at the time. Because when the Sheikh first moved to Medina, he used to pray in the masjid. He would alternate from the masjid, I think it's called Fatima, Masjid Fatima, which is behind the Sheikh's house, very close, and the masjid, which is the students' one. 
Now the Sheikh being how he is, he loves students of knowledge. So we just went there, we saw the Sheikh, mashallah, couldn't really give salam or anything like that. And I think maybe I got an odd salam in once. And then I just gave this, uh, uh, the Sheikh salam. But subhanAllah, the Sheikh, it was different now seeing him after not seeing him for several years. Because whenever I had went, by the way, after the first ever encounter in Mecca, I always missed the Sheikh. Every single time I went, I missed him. He wasn't there. So now the Sheikh, he was in Medina with us. Um, time went by where students knew where he was and what have you, but they would just go visit him in his masjid. And this is before the doors opened to people to come ziyarat and what have you, because obviously the Sheikh is just settling. Some of his stuff hasn't, haven't, haven't come, furniture and whatnot, family there. And he's got his kids more or less were there, kind of. His kids were there more or less most of the times. There was, um, uh, I would say, some individuals um, that were known of those that know those that know those who they were at the time that were taking the sheikh to the masjid and what have you. There is no need for me to mention who they were because those people they know him, they know them, and they were obviously with the sheikh, uh, you know. And at the time, the sheikh. So I'm now living on this side and the Sheikh is there. I thought to myself, subhanAllah, wow, what, how ironic and what a coincidence. You know, how bizarre that the, the, the Sheikh out of all the places, the whole of Medina, Allah's decree that he's going to live literally right opposite me. When I mean right opposite, like I would cross the road in a couple of footsteps and I'm at the first Sheikh's house. So I was like, wow. So the Sheikh obviously um, carried on as it was going to the Salah. And it was a bit like hectic at the beginning, you know, obviously first time and what have you. So I just thought to myself, well, that would be khair if, you know, the sheikh uh, would be a bit free, maybe just to see if he's teaching anything, to try and see if he's going to benefit. But everything was hush hush. There was nothing going on in the beginning. It was all hush hush, all hush hush, literally. So what happened was um, the sheikh would come out and go to those masajid for Fajr and he did start coming up for Dhuhr I do remember he did start coming up for Dhuhr in the beginning okay in the beginning but when it started getting hot then he would stop so this is before I, I'm introduced to the Sheikh I have like a proper encounter with him properly or anything this is just me viewing it from the outskirts the outside and then what happened was the Sheikh I remember specifically he loves the masajid and those that follow the sunnah. When I, let me, I'll, you're going to understand what I mean afterwards. Because the sheikh, he loved the sunnah. He, that, you know, a lot of people misunderstood the sheikh for him being, thinking he's harsh. But it's just the sheer love that he had for the sunnah and adhering and following the sunnah. So I actually got those first hands on experience and I saw, okay, I understand now, kind of thing. Um, so eventually uh, the sheikh then for some weird reason I remember one day specifically I'm in my masjid and I'm praying salah and I'm, I've turned around now because I can hear people talking outside the masjid was rather empty and I remember it was Salatul Asr if I'm not mistaken Salatul Asr so I've now turned around or was it Dhuhr? no it was Salatul Asr Salat al-Dhuhr actually. Anyway, one of the two. I've turned around now and I've seen someone helping someone else. I'm thinking, who's this person, you know? But I can't see because what it was, they had something over their head. So as they've come into the message, they've taken it off the person's head and I could tell it was an old man. So I've looked and I'm thinking, subhanAllah, that's Sheikh Rabi'ah. What is he doing here kind of thing? I thought he's praying in the other masjid. Like, like I said, in the beginning it was hectic. Now it's kind of calmed down. So... And I've seen them helping because now I know I know who the driver is and I know who those people that those uh, brothers that come with the sheikh. So I've seen this myself. Oh, okay, kind of thing. And then once I've seen that, I think it's myself. Mashallah, is coming here. So this is what happened. This is like the first ever time uh, I remember. Yeah, the first ever time the sheikh basically was brought to the masjid because that now just to, to make you guys understand 
when I come at my house by the tawfiq of Allah, that's why I love subhanAllah the Muslim countries, Allah Akbar. May Allah make it easy for all of us to live there um, and all the other Muslim countries. As soon as I come out of my house, like I'm, I've reached, I can see the message from my house, but as soon as I step out of the house, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm literally there, the masjid. I literally, like a couple of, couple of footsteps and I'm there. So that was my local masjid. That's my closest masjid, which like I said, is right across the road from the sheikh. So I'm sitting down and I'm thinking to myself, subhanAllah, wow, like this is once again, another coincidence. And it just happened to be that the sheikh was brought over because there's like little things where, you know, if, if those that have been where you can rest your back, and they're at the front row. So I'm, I'm, I'm at the front. The sheikh's brought, round, he's brought round and he's brought, he's been placed or put right there. The sheikh decided to sit right next to me. So at the time, if I'm not mis, yeah, at the time I had an exam, I remember, and it was an exam in Tawheed. So I must have been revising at the time. I think it was, um, one of Sheikh's one of Sheikh Fawzan's books. So I'm just there revising my notes and reading over for an exam I, I think I had. So I wanted to use the Sheikh's notes, Sheikh Fawzan's uh, explanation, to better understand that which we covered in class. So I'm there reading. As I'm reading, um, the Sheikh must have looked at me. Now this is now my first ever encounter, like properly, and the Sheikh must have. Uh, had his stick, so he got his stick, and as he's prayed his sunnah to hit the masjid, he's got his stick and he tried to like look at me. So I've given the Sheikh salam anyway. I've given him salam and then I've carried on. Obviously, as he's coming, I've given him salam and I've carried on. I've carried on upon my business. I'm just you know reading. I don't want to disturb the Sheikh. He's going to adkar. He's going to pray salam and whatnot. Because alhamdulillah, I when I came to Medina, I saw, I kind of like what's the word? Analyzed how. Um, the people that I knew that were students of the scholars, how they would kind of be with the scholars, not to disturb them. Like, and I've seen incidents where students would just try to hover over the sheikh as he's doing his tasbih and the sheikh's told, you know, indicated to them, look, I'm still doing my adkar, wait for me, whatever. So I know just to give salam and karana upon my business kind of thing. That's the best way. It's the best method, uh, you know, because when you, and that's another advice I would give to those brothers that would go out there, when you get a bit too excited, with the fact that you know you're going to benefit from someone or what have you, then you may forget your mannerisms. But you have to bear in mind that you know you have to give them respect. They're human beings at the end of the day, so they want their own you know peace, comfort, and what have you. Anyway, so he's gone over like that as I've sat back down and I'm reading the book. He's tried to signal to me with his stick because obviously he had a stick. He's an old man, Allah Hafiz, and he wanted to see what I'm reading. So as I I I, I, I realized that I closed the book kept my hand in it and then I, I kept the bookmark and I, I gave it to him to see because he asked me, he goes, he goes, what are you reading? So I've told him what I'm reading and then I, I showed it to him. He goes, uh, and then he kind of signaled to me like, and he, he responded to me and said, that's good, carry on reading. So he just wanted to check out what, what I'm reading. So I thought, okay, kind of thing. So then I carried on, Salah finished and then the Sheikh, he left the masjid. Um, and then I remember I just followed the Sheikh out and like I said, didn't disturb him or anything or, you know, because I don't want to be in the bad books of the Sheikh as I've got this ill-mannered or I'm just pestering him and I'm bothering him. No, the Sheikh went back into the car and went. And then I realized that the Sheikh, he kind of saw it to be a place where he can come again, this masjid. Okay, because like I said, he was gone, he was he was in the other masajid. And there's a couple of masajid. Obviously, this is Milian, mashallah, it's full with masajid. Milian bin masajid, mashallah, Allah rahman. Of course, which is no surprise, you know. Um then afterwards, time went by, and there was I think it happened two to three times, I would say, where the Sheikh I remember I was leaving and it once again just happened as a coincidence. I'm leaving my house. And I've seen that the sheikh is coming out of his house because now I know obviously where his house is, and the driver's coming out, but there is the brothers are not there, the look the normal brothers that will be there to help the sheikh. So when I've seen that, I remember one time when what happened was the driver himself obviously he's driving the sheikh he can't drive the sheikh put the sheikh in and then drove, drive round and then leave the car right in front of the masjid which is blocking the way and then bring the sheikh in and so he obviously needs. 
people that are going to be able to be there, prompt and help him. That time, Qadr Allah, I don't know what happened with the brothers, they weren't able to make it. And then, so one time I remember he came and then he asked me to help me, to help him, sorry, with the Sheikh. Because obviously he had seen that I had come once or twice, or three times. He'd seen my presence around the Sheikh when other, the other guys are there. Just giving salam to the Sheikh and whatever. So then one time I remember, on my first ever time, the Sheikh was there. He came and the guy asked him. So like I said, like I want to respect the Sheikh. I don't want to just, because he doesn't know who I am. At the end of the day, Jabba doesn't know who I am like that. So I don't want to just bar, you know, bombard him or just barge in and be like, hey, yeah, I'm here for help, kind of thing. And before I mention what happened, I remember one time, I'll never forget this, subhanAllah. And um, this goes to show that at the end of the day, when you want to do something, and I asked Allah Azza wa to accept it and make it sincere for the sake of Allah. Because at the time, and I asked Allah and I hope it was for the sake of Allah and sincerely for his sake, I literally just wanted to benefit from the shaykh. Nothing else. I had no idea that I would get to the stage where I'm close to the shaykh. Never. I literally just wanted to benefit from his knowledge. So I remember there was a, a time, there was a British brother who was obviously close to the shaykh and what have you. And he... I would see him coming and he was known, obviously he'd come help the Sheikh and some other British, and, and another British brother, so mainly just two. Uh, and they would come at different times. So I remember one time I went to this brother and I said, look, uh, if you need help and what have you, I, I, I don't live far, I just live there if you need help with the Sheikh. And he goes, no, 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 we're okay, okay, it's okay, no problem, you don't need to. And then I remember, I think a week went by, or a couple of days, one other brother that I knew, who went back to, he didn't complete his studies, but he went anyway, he, he was there at the time. And um, he told me, Abdullah, uh, I just saw the Sheikh yesterday, mashallah, the brother let me in. I'm thinking, oh, so obviously, the brother I let him in is obviously, you know, British brother. He's British, I'm British. You know, we all kind of know each other. I thought to myself, that's a bit, you know, it's a bit cheesy, as we say. It's a bit, yeah, I mean, you know, at, at the very least, why is it that I, when I went to that brother to ask him, could I, you know, be let in? Why is it that he said to me, no? Because I didn't ask him to, I remember the first time I went to him, said, do you need any help? So he said, no, I said, okay, hey, no problem. I said, no, I'm just, I'm obviously just there. If you do need any help, let me know. And then I remember another time I said, um, it was it, uh, you know, is it possible to see the sheikh or whatever, I'll give salam? And he said, no, 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 it's, it's not. He said, basically, I, I got rejected. I was like, hey, no problem, no problem at all whatsoever. I didn't take it of anything. I just thought, no problem, maybe it's just a tight thing where no one's allowed to give salam to the sheikh or... In terms of like, I'm talking about one-to-one, -one, just give salam, you know, can you give me advice, kind of thing. And then I'll keep it moving. Or, and my other approach was, if the sheikh needs help, I'm there. You know, I live right here. It's not going to be an issue for me because I live right here. So I was told no. Then days went by, this brother I meet. And um, at the time, obviously, I was very close to the brother. Uh, you know, I used to see him regularly and what have you. I knew him from the UK, so I said, so he came to me and said, Baba, you know, Alhamdulillah, I just got to see the Sheikh, you know, da -da -da -da, and mashallah, it was nice, da -da -da -da. I thought, okay, khair. But then I thought to myself, why is it that if it's the fact that, um, why is it that if it's the fact that you, like, you know, I went, and then afterwards um, I asked, I was rejected, I thought, no problem, I'm used to this whole British political stuff, no problem, I was like, no problem. But then when I get told, that he was told that he can go visit the, the sheikh and I literally, we live within the same proximity of the sheikh, more or less I thought to myself, okay, khair like I said, I didn't take it of anything no problem, I carried on, me, I just, I just carry, I carry on moving, I carry on moving you know, and I'll never forget the verse in terms of, you know, people that plot and plan and, you know, Allah khair al you know, at the end of the day, when someone plots and plans or um, whenever someone uh, rejects you for me or like this is not even well you can say it is from those that you can take as a lesson never ever give up with anything you know at the end of the day people will reject you people will speak about you people will um you know tarnish your name but just try and just put your head down try and be sincere as you can ask allah to make you sincere you know you know the, that weapon that you have is it supplication no one can get in the way of anything that allah has decreed for you and this was from the means that i saw the, from the signs that allah had decreed this so even if people didn't want it to happen it was already decreed 
50,000 years before we came into this existence this earth. Going back to the point, so when now that had happened, I just carried on respecting the fact that obviously, you know, I can't and I won't get be able to get advice from the sheikh and stuff like that. Knowing that literally a small city takes two minutes. All I wanted was the sheikh to give me advice. That's all I need. Just give me advice and I'll keep it moving. And that's it. You'll just see me give salams and that's it. I'm on my own business. I don't, I don't really, you know, I'm not going to come and be there and annoy you. And go, I won't, that's not me. That's not one of my characteristics anyway. So when it happened that there was no one there and the driver called me and he said, listen, take the sheikh's hand and take him inside. I thought to myself, wow, look at this. A couple of weeks back, I was told, can't help, I was rejected. But now I'm being asked to help out. So, I mean, yani, they're in need of the sheikh being helped. Because obviously the sheikh's an old man at the end of the day. You get it? And he needs that extra support. He's not strong physically. He needs that extra support. He's old. And at the time when he came to Medina, just for those that don't know, but he was roughly around 86 years old. I remember because he said it one time in the lesson in Masjid Rudwan that he's 86 years old when he was doing Sahih Muslim. So anyway, I wasn't supposed to mention that until then. But anyway, so then I helped the Sheikh, subhanAllah, that first. So though, just, just to kind of give you an insight, the first thing that was going through my mind was, subhanAllah, yeah, I, mean, I came from Harlesden. <laughs> For those that know Harlesden, I'm a London boy, come and I'm now helping the Sheikh that I've heard so much about. Yeah, and he, where is this going to go? Kind of thing. And subhanAllah, the Sheikh was nothing but gentle, kind. He thanked me as if I'm taking my grandfather to the masjid to pray salah. Literally, that's, that's, those were the emotions. I didn't try and use it as an opportunity. Sheikh, I'm this, I'm that. I'm blah, 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 my name is. That's, that's not how I am. That's not how I carry myself, you know? For those that even know, all that period of time, I've never ever, I, I, I never, I'd never ever had any sort of social media platforms anyway, and I didn't see of interest. I used to see it all the time. Well, like, I saw it as pathetic, and childish, and immature. These three things, sad, and low. That I'll see tweets. We just came out of the sheikh's house. We just, uh, we just visited the sheikh. The sheikh has given salam to everyone. Oh, we just visited the sheikh, and the sheikh gave us advice. And he's told us, Abdul Rahman al Somali, Abdul Rahman al Iraqi, Abdul Rahman al All this stuff is like, what are you doing this for, really? Come on. Like, okay, no problem. Yani, don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters, but yani, you can go visit the Sheikh, benefit, and then tell your people, but then to put it out there so your name is there. And this is what, this is what I mean. Like, I just saw that as whenever I would see those back then, was it? Yeah, it was Twitter, isn't it? Whenever I would see those tweets, I just used to be like, oh, come on, man, this is a bit, oh. you know, like, what's the, what's the, what's the ghaya? <laughs> you know, is this, is this, is this knowledge? And you're giving away knowledge that the sheikh has said, go tell the people, you know, the sheikh will like advise us with this, but then to put your name in it all the time and to be like, next thing you're, you're going to know, and the sheikh, he drank this specific drink and he had, wait, come on, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's immaturity is it's just slow, it's sad. Anyway, so. When that moment when I'm taking the sheikh in, this is now my first time, and it's not just me in the masjid. Like I said, it's just me and the sheikh. And when when the sheikh went in, I remember he was very harris all the time. To hate the masjid. I'll get him around, but he'll ask for a chair, or sometimes he'll pray on that place where you're resting your back. That he would sit on it, so he would sit on it and pray to hate the masjid like that, as he's standing up and he'll use it because he obviously can't pray fully standing up, but. Every time I remember, he would go into sujood. He would always, I never, very rarely I would see the sheikh, only on, we won't mention it, but only on Ramadan, I would see when he went to the haram and what have you, the sheikh was praying on a chair. And even, I remember the times when the sheikh would be like, Abdullah, khud li khursi. You know, Abdullah, get me the chair. And he would tell me, Wallahi, he goes, Yihzunini, and I will salli when I jadis. He would be like, it makes me sad to pray when I'm sitting down. I want to make sujood, I want to, but I can't, my body today is, I'm tired and this. You know, he would literally, that's how much he was so, he was so adequate to just pray. He was just so, so that's the hal of the sheikh. But at the time now, he was praying, mashallah, he was standing up, praying, I'll get him the chair. And then I remember the first ever time, I think it was the second time it happened. But this second time now, one of my friends, 
one of my friends, Mujahid, Allah, he was local. It just happened to be that he was there. Like he was coming to pray in that masjid. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, he heard of it or I told him or we spoke or whatever. But Muhim, he was there in the masjid. And then me and him both helped the Sheikh. And when we helped the Sheikh go in, I remember we, I saw the first other time he was saying, he, he told the Imam. And these are from the benefits that I took, the much how much he had, he loved the Sunnah and he would adhere to it and he would love the people that are you know leading him in Salah to follow the Sunnah. You know, he would be like, so he would tell the Imam and subhanAllah the first time he would say to, say to the Imam of my local masjid I remember um, you know I, I, that ego sometimes gets, gets to you isn't it because okay we're not going to jump but that ego sometimes you can see it's like you know you're Imam and you're being told and but he's an old man so um, that was the time when I first saw, mashallah, the Sheikh is proper, you know, wanting, he's encouraging the Sunnah, basically, he's glorifying the Sunnah, you know, and that's how the Sheikh was. And then I remember we, um, we left, and then the third time, the person that was supposed to come, he came. The brother that was supposed to come, basically, he came. But I remember he came late, and it happened, I think, uh, a couple of times he came late, because obviously he had work himself, and he was coming from far to come and meet the Sheikh and take the Sheikh to the masjid. So, the person that initially rejected me, I remember one time when they had a conversation, they were like, look, if you can't make it, let me know, so I'll make it. So, and for me, that happening in front of me was almost as if I wasn't, it wasn't a liked thing for me to be the one to have taken the sheikh those two occasions. Because we just, I just met the sheikh outside the car, and I remember, this is, Pana, this is how we were, I, I, I put the sheikh inside and I closed the door. You know, out of respect, literally out of respect, I didn't want to go inside the car because it's for me, that's how I would walk up and talk. You know, it's, it's, it's not my car. I haven't been given permission. And then I'll cross the road, me and the brother, and then the sheikh would come out of the car and then we'll take him out and just put him on the steps. I remember just put him on the steps and then he'll go inside and the driver would do the rest, put him in his house and what have you. And then I remember the driver would just have a conversation, me and the driver have a conversation, what have you. And then the next day happened, same thing, out of respect. Now, when the, the brother that was supposed to actually be there, um, when he came that last time, because, you know, we used to have a good relationship, he would speak to me and what have you, he told me, he's like, yeah, you can help out, whatever, this is that. But then I remember from the other brother, he didn't want it. He, I, I didn't understand as to the reason why. It's like, you know, I started thinking to myself, what's... Anyway, I thought to myself, politics, what have you, no problem. I'm used to these political things. It's been a couple of years now, it's 2015. You know, it's been three years. I'm kind of getting used to these stuff. You know, especially with someone like Sheikh Rabi as well. They want to obviously maybe persevere, uh, sorry, preserve him in terms of, you know, from people that maybe be wanting to do certain things. I kind of had it like that. But then I, when it went on, I thought to myself, okay, kind of thing. SubhanAllah. One time I remember there was no one there. And the driver was like, it was hot. And I managed to come out again. And when he found me, he said to me, just come in the car, jump in. So I jumped in, I remember. Um, and then came across so it came came over and when we came over to the masjid we helped out whatever and then obviously then they knew that the brother that was gonna supposed to be coming he can't always make it on time and then i would come for salat al-dhuhr as well i remember so salat al-dhuhr i'll be there i come from the jamia i help out but there was another brother i remember this other brother that was helping out he was always prompt mashallah and he lived not far from me as well so he, he was from the first, I remember. I remember and he told me he was like from the first. Like Salat al-Fajr, I remember he was to be the one taking the Shaykh and you know, because he was from the first and he knew about it as well. Well where I was oblivious to the Shaykh moving in and the timings and masajid he would go to. So anyway, and he was a nice brother. So then I remember one time this the brother that kind of didn't want it to happen, he met me in the masjid again when the Shaykh now is coming more frequently to my masjid. And then when he met me, he like was there, gave him salam obviously, and gave me salam. And then he saw the sheikh, I gave the sheikh salam. When we were leaving, maybe because he saw that, you know, there was no other choice, Allah knows best anyway, but only then he introduced me. He goes, he introduced me to the sheikh and he said, uh, Sheikh Ana, uh, Abdullah bin Britannia, this is as a student. And the sheikh obviously gave me salam and responded. And then, khalas, time went, and then, uh, yeah, and then, khalas, then that's it. 
But there was never ever any sort of approval in the beginning Up until today, I don't know why But like I said, maybe those were the reasons where the Sheikh You know, they thought I was going to be this or that or that Anyway um, So with regards to us going back to the story of the Sheikh We now needed to decide in terms of timetable was What was going to happen so I remember I was brought into the convo because they knew that I was local and they knew that I had been there when the Sheikh had no one there and I was obviously from those that were able to help the Sheikh. So I remember, I'll never forget, um, Salatul Isha and Maghrib, the, that brother was there, the one that initially didn't want it to happen, he was there and he would be the one taking the Sheikh Hamimah to the Haram for Isha and Maghrib was local most of the times. And then afterwards, for Fajr, it was him as well. I'm not, yeah, it was Fajr, it was him. And then Dhuhr, sometimes it was me or the other brother that I mentioned. And then I said it was me. And sometimes the brother that had worked would come. And if not, it was just me and the Mawdivan brother. Uh, brother Mujahid. So then I remember when the Sheikh got a bit more settled in there was they started to be liqa'at you know as you can say like gatherings um to meet the sheikh in his house and this would usually take place after salat al isha because obviously the sheikh has come back from the haram and it's much more convenient there's no salawat in between but before that happened obviously when we started going to the sheikh um you know once or twice or whatever i remember one incident that happened where the sheikh would um, have lessons. Now, these lessons in the beginning, they weren't really known where they would do, be, be done in the masjid or whatever. But obviously, we started helping the sheikh out, and it was known that the sheikh is teaching. So then we heard the sheikh is doing lessons in his house. So one time, I think we must have seen, the first time around, we just saw a big number, and I think it was Maghrib time or something like that, or Isha. And we decided to go. And I just crossed the road, I remember I was with the, I was with my, the brother, Mujahid And then we saw like a big gathering It was a couple of, it was just a couple, well not big when I say big But meaning it was like just done and then they were waiting and they just went down the stairs So then when they went down the stairs I realised it was the, the Sheikh was teaching So I asked, I remember, I did ask the brother that was known, the Sanj brother that was known That was kind of like organising stuff that was being done in the Sheikh house And lessons and gathering and whatever And, it's, and I remember Wait, we said we wait. He said, Wait to see if the numbers is too much and then we can see. And then, alhamdulillah, eventually we were let in. We went down, and these were the beginning of the first like Sahih Muslim lessons that were private. And they were private, like no one knew about it at all, like literally no one. And they kept on for a couple of lessons, really beneficial. I remember the Sheikh son was there, Sheikh Muhammad bin Rabi, and so many other people. It was beautiful, mashallah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful moments. I remember we had the note, I had the book, and then just the Sheikh would be given an explanation. It was nice. Maybe I'd say odd, for, let's say 20 to 30. When that happened, unfortunately, people can't be trusted. I think it was like maybe the fourth lesson or something. News, basically, they started to spread someone that, would, that, would, that was there coming. I think must have taken a picture. And sent it around or just sent it around that the Sheikh teaches Sahih Muslim in his lesson or something about I've just come out of the, the Sheikh's house and teaches Sahih Muslim. The next day the Sheikh was supposed to have a lesson. When I tell you, I kid you not, it was as if the whole of Medina had come to wait outside the Sheikh's house. Literally the whole of Medina. So obviously they couldn't reject, but it was packed. It was rammed. It was literally like crows, panel like it was it was it was Main it was, it was crazy. It was like, literally like you'll be like, whoa, what's going on? So anyway, the Sheikh uh, did that lesson and then afterwards it was known that the Sheikh stopped those lessons, meaning that because of that incident, yeah, because the house is small. And obviously it's the house, it's the Sheikh's basement where his books were. And that's where if it was a big gathering, he would meet the people, not upstairs in his in his bedroom. Um so that was the last of those lessons and they got stopped for a bit <laughs> That's what happens though isn't it? One ruins it for the rest So going back now 
the shirk I remember. Um, we started now being with the Sheikh more in terms of taking him. It became like a habit now. Now it became a habit and it was kind of, let's say, approved. If you want to use those words, I'll understand. And when the Sheikh would come down, I know the timings, whatever. So then the, the driver started telling me, look, come at this time because of this time and whatever. Because obviously now it's a thing where we have to be prompt because we don't want the Sheikh. He doesn't want the Sheikh to come out. If I'm obviously going to, you know, volunteer to come and help I, I need to be on time so that the driver is not left stranded by himself with the sheikh so we were like okay no problem we'll do it i'll make sure that i'm free at that time to make sure that i'm on time and whatever and when we when the sheikh would come around when we would be with the sheikh and we would drive around whatever it was known and like as soon as the sheikh comes we give him salam kepalik and this is that i remember when he first asked me for my name i told him my name where i'm from whatever and the Sheikh, what would he do as soon as it'd be okay, whatever, no problem, okay, go in the car. Hussein, the, the driver, he'll put the Quran on straight away. Hussein, it was his driver's name, he'll put the Quran on straight away, literally. It was that was a habit. The Sheikh, as soon as he steps into the car, Quran, listens to the Quran. And that's something that I picked up as like subhanAllah Ajib, wow. You know, that's once again it's a benefit that I'm picking up. That the Sheikh just wants to he doesn't want to get involved in idle talk, nonsense, this is that. Just listen to the Quran, benefit from your time. And it's literally a Two minute to five minute, not even five minutes, two minute drive just to go around, go to the masjid. So, when we take the sheikh out, obviously the sheikh, you could tell, sometimes, subhanAllah, the sheikh will be doing his tasbih, his akar. You see, the sheikh, he had this thing, subhanAllah, I remember I would tell the brother, he's got this like aura and like, you know, uh, this character, you know, haiba is the best word to use. The sheikh has this haiba where if you're next to the sheikh and you meet him like he's very serious he looks he looks very serious like literally he looks very very serious but then because of that you feel like okay can i can i ask him something can i speak to him i don't know what to say let me just be like helping him and because basically i would hold his i would hold his left arm okay and i would use my right arm because why because i remember one time when i tried to go to the other side he put me to the other side, his left, because his right arm, he holds it with his stick. So he holds his stick with his right arm. I'm holding his left arm, helping him so that he can walk. And then obviously he would walk using his right. So he's got his right stick and he's got, so both sides is getting support. When I'm holding him, I said, okay, I just have to just hold him like this and just not say anything. But subhanAllah, there'll be, a, there'll be, there'll be times when I remember I've come, we'll drive around, whatever, and then we get there to the, my local masjid. And... And um, it, he didn't just stay there. He went to different masajids, but we'll get into that later. And as I've come round, I've come out of the car to help the sheikh. He's got this beautiful smile on. When I, I kid you not, the smile that he would have on. And he, I'm just telling you about his characteristics. You know, the smile completely changes the atmosphere. And that's how the sheikh, I got to see that side of the sheikh. Completely changes the atmosphere. Completely, like the whole. It's like wow. Like okay, yeah, sheikh. You know, let's let's just chill, kind of thing. He gives he gives on this face that you know I just want to chill. That's how friendly and gentle he looked, and on this beautiful smile, and it just completely changed the mood. Completely, like completely. So anyway, we we'll bring him to the to the masjid. Same thing. He would pray, and the sheikh. Whenever he would see anything, he would always that's against the sunnah. He would always try and change it, always try and advise and what have you. But some people misunderstood him because obviously he's old. So he's not going to come and the way he's going to advise, he's not going to be the same way as someone younger. Obviously he's old, so certain things, you overlook them because he's older. And that's just known, isn't it? It's just known. But And the Sheikh, he has this love for the Sunnah. So some people think that it's harshness, but it's not. It's just the love for the Sunnah. So I remember the first time um, I got a bit of confidence, I would say. Uh, before that, yeah, when I told him that, um, yeah, I'm from the UK, whatever, originally from Uganda, this to start, the Sheikh, he, he told us the story of when he went to Kenya. There's a story when he went to Kenya. And the story goes that he went, and when he went to Kenya the first ever time with the brothers, he went there and he wanted to give da'wah to the people. And when he wanted to give da'wah to the people, he was there giving da'wah to them and what have you, and Apparently people said that people there were upon a lot of like shirk and bid'ah and whatever and they're very staunch upon it. And the sheikh said that he stayed there, he gave da'wah to them, gave them da'wah, gave them da'wah. 
and he prayed in their masajid and stuff like that and he spoke to them, gave him mawridha, admonition and he said by the end of it, subhanAllah when he had left, before he had left, a lot of them came so when they first encountered the shaykh they didn't understand where he's coming from but towards the end they had so much love that they went up to him and a lot of them accepted his da'wah and his call that they left off by the time he had left a great number of them he told us that they had left off the um, that which they were upon in terms of innovation in terms of you know the shirk maybe that they were upon and what have you and this was for me like uh, inspiring to hear that the sheikh had traveled had left because obviously you don't it's not something that you is out there and you know it's publicized i would say but a lot of the ulama for those that don't know they do travel but they don't really you know inform others about it some of them have traveled and they go to certain places of the world like regularly but it's not a thing where they want to just keep it something that is between them and Allah and those that know that they're there so that was mashallah inspiring for me to hear and when I got the confidence yeah yeah the time and I thought okay yes I really want to just I don't want to just keep on because I know and I heard that the sheikh he loves to benefit from this time so then I asked the sheikh I said sheikh and I, yeah, and he, do you give us permission to read and I remember I had the, the first book I wanted to read was Usul al I was like, Shaykh, I need to give us permission to read. Um, you know, we want to benefit from you. And the Shaykh goes, Naam, tafaddal. And we were like, wow. So I had the book, but I thought the Shaykh meant, okay, yeah, we can read next time. And the Shaykh said, do you have the book with you? And he said, what book is it? I said to him, Shaykh, and Usul al He said, what's the sharh? Who's the, who's the sharh? Who's, who's the, the one, the, the one that, that, that explained it? So we were like Sheikh and Sheikh of Amin. And I remember it was Sheikh Faymin's one, the black one, those that know. Um, so the Sheikh was like, Yalla, tawadal, ikra. So obviously I start, so it was me, it was me and the brother. And like I said, I wasn't ready for it. Even the brother, he didn't have his book, he didn't have his book. He just had like a, a, a pen and whatever. Alhamdulillah, I had, obviously I carried a pen with me. And he had, I think, like a little notepad or something anyway. So I just began. SubhanAllah, I said the best man, Alhamdulillah, whatever. And then I started reading. And I started reading the Sheikh straight away. He started giving ta'liqat. He started giving, you know, uh, started explaining the book quotations, as they say. And it was literally a couple of minutes. It wasn't long, but obviously those times, at the times now, rubber is getting more packed. So just that whole two minute round takes a bit longer because there's traffic making the U-turn and whatever. And plus the driver, he drives very slow. He doesn't want to go over any humps fast. He doesn't want to, he wants it to be a very smooth journey for the Sheikh. So we've driven around, gone back. By the time we've driven around and gone back, there's so many fawaid already that we've taken from the Sheikh. I was like, Allahu Akbar, yani subhanAllah. Um, so I didn't, I remember, I didn't ask anyone permission. And I thought to myself, you know what? It's a Sheikh, I want to benefit. I don't, I don't need to ask or go through anyone. Let me directly ask the Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, the Sheikh agreed. And he was, we didn't, we didn't bother him. It wasn't too much. It wasn't anything. Just merely us reading couple of statements from Sheikh Muhammad Abdul Wahab and that's it the Sheikh will give his own shah and it was beautiful and so I think that was the first now I'm starting to get a bit more comfortable with the Sheikh I'm starting to learn his characteristics at the stage and it's all early early stages this is before anything happens before we go to the period of you know me um, with the Sheikh having to go to different massages the Sheikh telling the driver and me as well, and the brother that we you know, I want to go to this mission, try this masjid, whatever. And this is before even the sheikh gets fully, fully comfortable, before any major liqa'at, any major gatherings happen, you know, and before the time where um, they needed help to take the sheikh to the haram, that time as well, before Ram the Ramadan's entered, before, before anything. This is still early stages. This is the beginning of the journey that, you know, I believe, I hope, it becomes a benefit to those listening. I don't want to make it too long, so I think stopping it here would be perfect. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it sincere for His sake. And Wallahi, when you, inshallah, join me on this journey where I share my experiences with the Sheikh, you would see the other side that I saw of the Sheikh. And once again, side note, we're not glorifying anyone, any individual, anyone, but just to be a benefit to those listening, to those they can know that. فعلاً بعلماء they are the inheritors of the prophets. وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم إحسان إلى يوم الدين.
واخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اخوكم في الاسلام عبد الله بن خميس